welcome to Sunday Morning Live. Good morning, I'm Sean Williams. That's an Egyptian tomb guard, and it's all looking a little bit antiques roadshow this morning. As British troops depart from Cambastian in Afghanistan, and as we remember the 100th anniversary of the First World War, we ask, is war glorified? Now, the coming week is for remembrance remembering the 453 British servicemen and women who died in the campaign in Afghanistan. And in seven days, on Remembrance Sunday, all those who fell in battle across the generations. In particular this year, a century after the outbreak of the First World War, honouring the nearly one million British and Commonwealth troops who lost their lives. As the troops leave and remember those who fell, Britain commemorates another conflict where its soldiers died on foreign fields. A century ago, it was supposed to be the war to end all wars, with men fighting for king and country. Those expecting a quick end to the conflict witnessed instead a long fight mired in trench warfare. The hundreds of thousands who died are being commemorated in a dramatic memorial at the Tower of London, where a sea of ceramic poppies lay, attracting vast crowds paying tribute. So, a particularly poignant time of remembrance coming up when we honour those who made the ultimate sacrifice. What, though, about the way society and, ultimately, history views conflict? Do we glorify war with our commemorations, flypasts, medals and stories of heroics? We're going to discuss that with our guests now, including retired British Army officer Major Tim Cross. Welcome to the programme, Tim, uh, who served in Northern Ireland, the Balkans and Iraq. And joining us from our newsroom studio is the historian Neil Faulkner, who's author of No Glory, The Real History of World War I. Welcome, Neil. I can see there you're wearing a, a, a white poppy. Why no red one? Uh, the white poppy, I think, because it makes the point that uh, the First World War, the Second World War and all of the other wars that our rulers have waged over the last uh, century, really, since poppy commemoration began after the First World War, have been wars for empire and profit. Uh, they've been wars where uh, the rich benefited and ordinary people uh, didn't. So there is a waste of war that needs to be remembered and we need to learn the lessons of history so that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. The red poppy doesn't do that. Uh, the red pop poppy muffles those lessons of history. Why the does white it, could, I, could I ask, why does it muffle the lessons of history? How does it glorify war by, by wearing a, a red poppy as opposed to a white one? I, I think the problem with the red poppy is that everybody can uh, wear it. So a modern-day warmonger like Tony Blair can wear a red poppy even as he prepares to launch new wars or he engages in wars in the uh, present. What the white poppy is saying is that there are questions to be asked about why our rulers uh, go to war. There's been a controversy, of course, um, about the uh, poppy display in the Tower of London. Uh, that's blown up over the last week. And, and I share the views of the Guardian art correspondent, who has quite rightly said the problem with the red poppy is it's consensual. The problem with the red poppy is it doesn't pose any difficult questions. And that's what art is supposed to do. All right. Uh, the, the, he also said it was too pretty and conveyed a fake nobility. But we should say the, the designer, Tom Piper, said it's not an installation about war or violence and barbarity. It's about loss and commemoration and has given individuals a unique way to tap into their family history and appreciate the human cost. Um, Major Tim Cross, listening to some of those points that, that Tim made there, not, not just about the poppy, but the way we look at and depict war, what are your thoughts? Do we glorify it in, in looking back? I don't think so. I, I mean, I, frankly, I disagree with most of what he had to say. I think the idea that you know, tens of thousands of people going to look at these poppies at the Tower of London are there to glorify war is a complete nonsense. They're there to recognise the sacrifice and the blood and, uh, and all the awful things about war and to remember, in many cases, their own relatives who died you know, on a battlefield somewhere in, in Europe. So I think we have to, I, I would say we have to separate out two things. One is the individual people who fight on operations and who sacrifice themselves not just through death but through injury and through the traumatic experiences they go through and, and the environment that they're operating in and so forth and separate out, that out from the cause of the war and, and what we're fighting for and so forth, which inevitably will be 
controversial. People have different views about that. Indeed, and we're not here to talk about the rights and wrongs of war either. We're here to right. talk about how war is, is depicted and, and this issue of, of whether there is some glory to be had by it, or at least that's how it's interpreted. I wonder, uh, Francesca, whether it's a, an issue of language. You know, on the Cenotaph we have the glorious dead. Um, the Queen's Royal Lancers regimental mo motto is death or glory. The word glory is attached to conflict. And I, and I think, you know, looking throughout history, um, not just in, in Western context, but non-Western context too, the glorification of war is a constant motif. And the reason for that is that people wouldn't go to war if there weren't some kind of ideological packaging of this. Um, you have to glorify the war dead. This is a part of a state machine that's been in operation for thousands and thousands of years as a means of trying to get hundreds and thousands of people, normal, ordinary people, to, to sacrifice their lives. Tim, would you say there is glory in war? Yes, actually. I, I mean, I get rather irritated and bored with people who seem to have no sense of the fact that most of what we've engaged with over the last you know, period of time is because we passionately believe in the rule of law and democracy uh, and the ability of people to live their own lives in freedom. Now, do we get that wrong? Of course we do. But in, in the context of what... I mean, I'm an ordinary bloke who's been on a number of operations around the world, and I passionately believe that the places I've been are there to release people from dictatorship and from, from harsh rule. I mean, I've watched the mass graves being dug up in places like Iraq. So it's easy to sit in comfortable studios and pontificate about the niceness of it all. Mm. I mean, I am, I'm pretty passionate about it. Uh, what, what do you, are you been to many war zones, Michael, in your yeah, career? Yeah, and it, I don't need to be told how uh, horrible war can be and what death looks like uh, uh, st stared in the face. Um, uh, the idea that the Second World War was a war waged by politicians for empire and profit mm. seems, uh, seems utterly bizarre to me. Mm. I mean, I think you could have really interesting arguments about uh, the political and strategic confusion over more recent wars like Iraq uh, and Afghanistan. But on the central issue, I see quite the opposite. I see um, a revulsion against war, not a glorification against war. Nobody reads Rupert Brooke, everybody reads Wilfred Owen. Um, I haven't seen the Brad Pitt film Fury, but I imagine it's very like the D-Day film Saving Private Ryan, which actually felt like being in a war. You could hear the incoming bullets, you could see what happens when hot metal hits, uh, hits human flesh and so on. I think quite the opposite is the case. Okay. The, one argument I would make is yeah. I think we sanitise we have an awful lot of fictional violence on television, uh, but we over-sanitise uh, news coverage of violence such think? that I don't think we get a proper impression of exactly how empty, how, uh, you know, what the consequences are for the people who do it in our name, mm. who I think the poppies are just a wonderful symbol of memory of what they did in our name, but I think rightly or wrongly. Okay, you see that sanitisation as well, though, in, in, the, in the war cemeteries. There's a sense of imposing order and cleanness and nightly, nice, neat lines in these war graves. But actually, you know... Why do about... you need to see the brutality because to, to know about... that it exists? Because I think it's a, a human engagement. You have to see the brutality. I, I quite like... I, I agree with many of the points that the, the speaker made, but yeah, I, yeah. I quite like the poppy display at the Tower of London. This is about a huge military fortress, one of the most important, oldest fortresses, a military centre in this part of the world that's got blood pouring out of it. This was a, a site of state execution as well as an imprisonment, as well as being a fortress. And, and I think... I think the poppies do represent there, in that context, something of the blood and the horror of this blood tumbling down in the form of poppies. But at the same time, I think there is a tendency in some of the war, the war cemeteries to try to tidy it up and to make it clean and neat. You know, but maybe that's just about respect, isn't it? That's sort of about respecting the dead. How would, you, how would you prefer these cemeteries look? I've, Absolutely about respect, but you know, compared to something like the Holocaust Museum um, in in Jerusalem or Auschwitz, there you see, in a very respectful way, but the horror of what went, these people went through: piles and piles of human hair, but those, piles those, of shoes. Those museums and other places are very important, and they are, uh, you know, they're one-off places. The, 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 the war cemeteries in France and Belgium. I mean, the awesomeness of standing in a place like that. I'm a, a lot of them have, have words written on the gravestones, as you probably know, and a regimental hat badge in the age of the people who've been, who've been killed, you know, terribly young people. Mm. Um, but as, as I remember standing in Bayeux, surrounded by thousands of these things, and written on one gravestone was, uh, to the world he was but one of many, but to us he was all the world. I mean, every one of those gravestones represents a human life, and in that environment it is... 
it is all the things which, you know, finding it difficult to put into words. But the idea that somehow this is supposed to be neat and tidy, I just, to be honest, I just think it's nonsense. So, so I th 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 I'd like to bring Neil back in at this point. You've heard what our guests have been saying in the studio, Neil, that there, there is um, a, an honour in depicting the brutality and the horror of war in, in a particular way. Uh, you don't need to show... Uh, the, the, the full brutality of it to know that, that it happened and to know how many people died. But, but you see, a commemoration without understanding is easy and pointless because if we're not learning the lessons uh, of history, the danger is that we repeat the mistakes of the past. I don't know what some of your contributors in the studio think caused the First World War. I don't know what they think the British Empire was fighting for. I'm very, very clear. The British and the French empires were fighting to protect their existing empires which were the biggest in the world at the time from Germany and right. at the end of the but, war but, but are you they took the, they, against the cause at, or at the, are you looking at, back at, at the lives lost in that cause but, but, and, and respecting but the, but, the dead but, but but the lives are lost in a war for the rich in a war to increase the size of the British and the French empires the British and the French carved up the Middle East <laughs> at the end of the war <laughs> and their intention their intention was to carve up Turkey as well right. but they were prevented okay, well, from doing not, so by the Turks okay. this, as, as this was say, a war for empire this what isn't do, about what, the what rights and wrongs of war. This is about Bridget the depiction of war. This is about the depiction of war, Neil, not about the rights and wrongs. Otherwise, I'm afraid we're, we're going to need an awful lot more time. But w with your last point, what, what do the guests make of? But my question to the guests is, is why, why do they think 15 million people were, died, uh, were, were killed in four years of industrialised okay. carnage? Again, what goes, do they think this that, was about? That goes back to, to the rights and wrongs, and really I wanted to look at how, how war was depicted. Akishwa, okay, sure, you've, be, you've been listening patiently to what our, all our guests are saying. How do you think war is depicted? Is it depicted in the right way? Uh, well, you know, as a Gandhian and as a non-violent person, I would obviously say that war is not the way to go. And it shows actually the real reason for war is the failure of our politicians to bring people to the negotiating table. And it's like, you know, when children fight and they eventually start just beating each other up. And I think there is an immense loss and that immense sacrifice and the collateral damage, I think that needs to be highlighted more, much more than um, I agree to some extent that we shouldn't pretty it up. But I also appreciate the installation which has now been done at the Tower of London because I think we often need to just step back and remember the, you know, the thousands of young lives which have been lost to us. And I think that depiction is very essential. But yes, we should not glorify it because the enemy also glorifies war and you have instances now for example of the Islamic State offering glory not just in this world but in the next world as well so I think glory is the wrong argument but looking at the loss the sacrifice uh, the, the families that are left behind what is the real damage what is the real cost of war that is something that we all need to introspect. Yeah, but Michael was saying earlier yeah. that actually the way it's depicted in some films you, know, you do get a sense of, of no, the so horror of it but on television, perhaps it's sanitised too much. So, so how would you... I think so. I mean, I was at the centre of all sorts of arguments about how much we showed and how much we didn't show. And I think, uh, I think British television, and not just the BBC, but also uh, ITN and so on, does actually um, cut out more of the depiction of, of real violence than, than almost any other country I know, such that you can't even show, uh, you know, the, the, the pool of blood on the, on, the, on, on the pavement or anything. And I think there's a, there's a danger that, uh, that people become disabled associated from it and only experience violence through through fictional violence okay. and there is a danger there briefly Neil. well I'd agree with that I, I think but the idea that, mo that there's only a few people who really understand this and, and these you know uh, rather arrogant comments frankly by historians to say we're the only people who understand the reality of war the vast majority of people who are going to these memorials who are going to remembrance services in the coming week are remembering a whole mixture of things pride in, in their relatives, in the people who were prepared to sacrifice themselves for principles which are important. Those who argue for an unjust peace and not a just war can argue that comfortably in their university studios writing their books. That is not the same as watching the reality of a brutal world out there. But they're also remembering the reality that, you know, war is a terrible thing. It is mm -hmm. brutal. It does create mayhem and chaos and so mm -hmm. forth, and people suffer as a result of it. We're, we're, as part of the reality of humanity.
Major Tim Cross, thank you very much. And thanks to our guest, Neil Faulkner, as well, who's joining us from our newsroom studio. I think perhaps we do need a lot longer time <laughs> and a bigger studio debate to talk about the rights and wrongs. But sadly, we don't have that time here. Thank you both.